my studio is based within, you know, the centre X shop of a reasonably well-known brutalist building in the centre of London. So this is where I make my work. And so it becomes really fascinating to actually consider the idea of bodies, humans, being surrounded by beings. So a lot of the work here was always about well, trying to comprehend the idea of a, of, a, of a type of being, or the physicality, or the sort of the mental kind of facility of being. And so the brain paintings were always made here. The foam beings were made here, the, the falling bodies were made here, and a lot of the youth works, or the early ones, were rehearsed here. And so in a way there is a sort of an idea that this is a sort of a research area for, for, for kind of understanding kind of different sort of aspects of physicality, being, flesh, the idea of sort of the technical new flesh, this kind of idea of sort of the technological and the biological in some kind of uh, coexistence. And so for me, the, that's the sort of um, a fascinating group of, of subject matter in one place. I think that the residue of this show probably started during the period when I was researching Variant CJD. It was about the idea of the predicament of being, the predicament of the human, the way that sort of the environmental contamination towards the human and the human also being part of the contaminating system somehow. And I wanted to sort of draw attention to those levels, draw attention to those sort of, you know, the strata of the predicament of human being. Um, and so I wanted to propose different humans. The foaming objects are anthropomorphic. Essentially, I am looking to build quickly through found objects, through found material, a sort of a new form, a new anthropomorphic form. And what they do is they hang on string, mostly some of them on plinths, but most of them are on string and they hang in space. And what they do is they emit substance. And so there's a compressor, some liquid, and the foam grows out of the aperture at the top where the mouth potentially would be, or maybe some other orifice would be. And so what we have is we have this being, we have this body hanging in space, emitting substance, and that substance is a sort of a proto-language, perhaps. It's kind of like a signifier for language itself. In a way, what I wanted to do was a slightly mean sort of reflection on human kind of occupation. It's sort of a, a sort of reductive reflection of the human somehow. We all occupy space. We all sort of hang in space in certain respects. And we all emit substance. And that substance is then the reality, is the, is the complication of reality somehow. They're uttering but not complicating. They're just simply emitting substance and so that for me was fascinating. Behind me and, and also in the show is a, is a group of works which are falling works. They're very simple, what they are is that they're sort of reclaimed bodies mostly from the film industry, they've served their purpose in that respect but what I want them to do simply is to fall. I want them to be set up on a wall and then to fall and this one behind me is a you know a, a silicon and foam body but it has a, a little bit of brain matter in. The plastic fiberglass body, which is more of a, a sort of an exoskeleton in a way. Inside its innards was inserted being in time by Heidegger. So there was a sort of a complexity which was given to the digestive system of the body somehow. You know, these are sort of rather overwrought kind of relationships. You know, ambiguous relationships between sort of a kind of an idea of, of a critical theory and, and the worldliness of things, but also of the idea of the falling body. And I think that there was a, a very much an idea which I'm very much attracted to, which is that, you know, as all humans, we are sort of perpetually in some kind of motion of falling. And I think that I wanted to draw attention to that, just simply to draw attention. Well, I'm, I'm always been fascinated by the anxiety that objects bring to the world, bring to us that, you know, that objects aren't necessarily designed to our best nature. You know, they serve a purpose, they serve a sort of a hyper-capitalist idea which we, you know, to, to sort of lubricate the world in a way which means that transaction can occur more regularly, more freely, um, more efficiently. And so in a way these objects are selected amongst those ideas, amongst the idea that somehow these corrupting objects, rather like a military jet engine which we have the youth perched on, it's, it's a very interesting object simply because it has a a male physicality. It's got two legs truncated, it's got a head, it's got a torso, and the youth sits on the face of the object somehow. There is a sort of subversion of where the youth sits within this authority figure of this military jet aircraft. And then it became very interesting to actually subvert the object much further and to insert another really technologically fascinating material like antidepressants. 
which is a sort of a blunt instrument, rather like a hammer, which actually sort of affects our sort of psychological relationship to the world. And I thought that that sort of interesting me mechanism is a really important and interesting uh, material in the world. Rather like sort of working with brain matter, working with antidepressants is another sort of ambiguity somehow. And so putting ambiguity into these engines and allowing the, the sort of the psychological framework of a, of a jet engine to become changed somehow seemed to be a fascinating proposition. Confused further by the presence of a youth. And so in a way these works are overlaps. There are these sort of surfaces that all have different relationships, different positions in the world, and that they are overlapping each other and complicating each other. There is no sort of grand kind of scheme of meaning that's being kind of found here. It's just about sort of the layering of ambiguities, the layering of, of materials which incongruously sort of sit awkwardly together. But still, they have this relationship to authority. They have this idea that we have um, structures in the world which maybe, you know, some kind of emancipation from would be kind of possible. I think the burying of the aeroplane has been fascinating for a number of years. I think that there was a sort of an adolescence, a literalness to that work, which I always found very fascinating. Um, I, it seems to sort of always been around in the periphery of some, you know, back of the imagination somewhere. And so it becomes interesting that you get yourself into a position or a time period where actually these things can actually be made, you know, that you can actually maybe enact them. And that that sort of literalness of the aeroplane then becomes quite fascinating in itself. Because simply all we're doing is we're taking an aircraft from the sky um, something of great sort of substance and mass and we're putting it under the ground and we're putting it under the ground and we're going to bury it. There is the anxiousness of the aeroplane itself, the, the layers of anxiety, that, that, uh, the, the globalisation, the, the sort of the ease of, of reality change from stepping off a plane from one place to another becomes almost a stoppage somehow. The aircraft itself is, a, is an object of power and it's been somehow reused. Um, and so it might be this artwork, this, this sculpture essentially, is um, allowing the next stage, the next stage of how we're supposed to relate to worldly objects, well, objects which you know, fundamentally have you know, impulsive relationships with our lives. It was fascinating that the cathedral allowed us to change the idea and the actual physicality of an evensong, a religious service. So what was radical and interesting about that piece was is it actually was a religious service. It wasn't a performance. It was something which had a different reality. There is a sort of formal ranking within the cathedral. You have the altar, you have this idea of authority, you have the, uh, the central authority of the cathedral, then you have the propaganda wing, which is the choir itself, and, uh, and they're in their ranks, usually. And I thought it was really interesting to scatter, to atomize the choir within the actual body of the cathedral, to, to almost sort of democratize the idea of the choir, to have them lie down, uh, to change the reality of the choir itself, uh, but also to separate them, make them individual units rather than as a, as a unison. And I thought that there was something really fascinating about that sort of fundamental change, that sort of separation from uh, the usual authority of an evensong. Today, the choir lie on the ground at the invitation of the artist. And we are invited to see and experience things differently, to see and hear things differently. They lie on the ground where in our ancient creation story, Life begins. There is a sort of a critique within the piece which is about authority. It is about the idea of um, the possibilities of um, readaptation of, of systems or ideas of authority. And so to suggest that something which is a vertical can be laid out to a horizontal is kind of an interesting kind of procedure. It's a sort of a, a move from a certain sort of hierarchical position into something which is slightly more democratic. And it has a sort of a linkage to a, to a work which I, I, I directly made about the altar the focus of our devotion to some degree, or, or religious devotion. And so it became really fascinating to disassemble, to deconstruct it quite physically, and to turn it into a powder of dust. Uh, and so in one of the galleries, that's what we see. We see the, um, the process of taking the focus of authority down into a powder form. Again, as sort of a democratization of form, a softer type of function somehow. <laughs> 
but still devotional. It's interesting, yes, ritualistic behaviour was always fascinating, and I suppose as an artist, the idea of a ritual was always to, to try and evoke um, the present into the future. It was always about some kind of idea of making some kind of bridge towards the unknowable. There is a sort of a, a cliched, problematic idea about what the human can move into into the future, what the human might become. And I think that actually the artist at this point needs to redesign, recreate those ideas, to actually inject the idea of optimism within the possibility of the future human. Um, I think that there is a sense of pessimism, there's a sort of phobic idea about the, uh, the technological, biological kind of intermingling that we might be sort of facing into the future. And so in a way I think that the artist's responsibility is to redesign the human in an optimistic way.